in the Old Testament, the book of Micah. The last chapter of the book of Micah, which is chapter number seven. Chapter number seven. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. I will begin reading at verse number seven. You can keep your Bibles open because we're going to touch all of these scriptures. Chapter seven, verse number seven says, Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be my light. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. Let's add verse 10. Then she that is my enemy shall see it and shame shall cover her which said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. Father, I give you praise today. I thank you for the wonderful atmosphere that's already in this church that's been here since the opening prayer. But Father, now I pray that you prepare our hearts, which you already have, for the word. Let this seed bring forth fruit. Set captive spirit free today, Father. Let those who are in a season of chaos be calmed. Let peace flood like a river today, I pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, anoint everything that comes out of my mouth in Jesus' name. Amen. I've titled today's message, Crisis Creed. The Crisis Creed. I believe we're in a time of crisis. When one watches the news report, it's easy to become gripped with fear at the coming doom or even at the very present sight of doom. We see reports of nightly shootings, horrible hate crimes, devastating storms, and we see a shift in our government from, uh, to a dictatorship away from democracy. It seems like one after one, freedoms are being taken away. And the church has experienced a moral debate. We're debating at what time what was well thought of as a pure written sin, but now we're debating whether it's right or wrong. And many people are accepting the old wrongs as the new rights. We're living in a crisis. A crisis is defined as a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. Maybe you have too much crisis in your own life to worry with a national crisis or a worldwide crisis. After all, how can you be, can be so concerned with out there when you're drowning in here? This is a time of crisis, and in our text, Micah the prophet was living in a crisis. I want to give you some of the signs of the crisis that Micah talked about in verses 1 through 6. Verse 1 and 2, the prophet comes looking for evidence of loyal, godly character, but he could find none. As if he's looking for fruit after all of it has been picked. Verse 3 says, men are successively doing evil with both hands. One can't seem to find an upright man anywhere. It appears everyone is out for blood. Verse 4 says, even the best of them seem to leave people wounded. The punishment has been predicted by the watchman. Verse 5 says, be careful, even your closest friends. Be careful because you cannot trust them. Watch what you say around them because if it benefits them, they'll turn their words around and use them against you. Verse 6 says, there's division among families. The old saying, blood is thicker than water. Oh, that's no longer. That no longer applies. Son is against father. Daughters are against mothers. And during this season of crisis, sometimes the worst enemy is the enemy living under your own roof. Oh, church, this is a time of crisis. And it doesn't take much explanation to relate the old words of the minor prophet Micah to explain the current crisis of today. Therefore, I will not waste time trying to convince you that we're living in a crisis because the evidence is all around and the prophetic scriptures are laying right before us. We're in a crisis. However, this morning, there's still hope. 
during Micah's crisis, he developed the crisis creed, which I want to explain in detail today. And let me start by saying, look up, things are going to get better. I know you're surrounded by a cloud of smoke and fog from the bombs that are exploding in your life, but God is still God. You still have breath in your lungs, so don't you give up, but rather call on the name of the Lord Jesus. He still has the power to save you. Oh, we may be surrounded by a great cloud of crisis, but Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 tells us we're also surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, let us throw off everything that hinders us and every sin that entangles us so that we can run with perseverance and we can run the race marked out for us. I choose this morning to be inspired and encouraged by the witnesses of heaven that's already made it through and they're here to encourage me to keep on pressing. I, re- I desire, I decide to endure to the end because I want to be saved and I want to be delivered. Amen, somebody. Micah verse 7 gives us the opening statement of the crisis creed. The crisis creed says, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. I certainly know that when one faces problems and persecutions, failures, and temptations, it's so easy to be overwhelmed by the sights around us. It's so easy to become uh, overwhelmed by the circumstances of the crisis. It's so easy to focus on the obvious things. It's obvious that I'm hurting. It's obvious that I've been wounded. It's obvious that I failed. It's obvious that my marriage is falling apart. It's obvious that I'm out of money. It's obvious that I'm depressed. Listen, can I challenge you today? Stop looking at the obvious and realize in all your junk, God is still right there. He's not left you. He's not forgotten you. He's still in your darkness. Therefore, the creed says, I will look to the Lord. Look to him. It may not be apparent, but he's there. Get your eyes off your circumstances and look to the author and the finisher of your faith. Look to Jesus Christ. Look up, church. Your redemption draweth nigh. I know it looks like we're all going to hell in a handbasket, but God's got a remnant that he's raising up out of the basket of destruction, destruction, and he's setting our feet on a solid ground, and he's going to make everything all right. Just look up. Jesus is still coming. Ah, in a time of crisis, you have to learn to wait. I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. Isn't that probably the hardest thing for church folk to do? Matter of fact, isn't that probably the hardest thing for worldly people to do? To wait. Every problem is not fixed overnight. I wish I could tell those that were in the altar this morning and those that I anoint with oil and lay hands on at the end of the service. I wish I could say, all right, go home. It will never be an issue. Sometimes that is the case, but sometimes God's going to take you through a maturing process. A baby doesn't go from a baby like Robin's holding to being a teenager. There's a process of growing and maturing to be able to handle what is a teenager. And a teenager doesn't go from River, who's mindless, to a 35-year-old that's finally got wisdom. No, no, no. It's a process of training in a process of maturing to finally know how to get to where you're going. But you got to be willing to wait. Go through the process. Psalms 27 verse 13 says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired and he will not grow weary. And his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. And he increases in the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. And young men will stumble and fall. But those who wait and hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Before you can mount up and fly on the wings of eagles you've got, and before you can experience the victory of the Lord, you must be willing to wait. Don't you give up. Look up and be willing to wait for the God of your salvation. You're not going to find anything better. You're not going to find anything more encouraging. You're not going to find a fix it quick scheme that's going to really fix your problems. So wait on the God of your salvation. 
And then the second, the third part of this creed says, my God will hear me. In order for him to hear you, you've got to call out to him. Just call on him and he will answer. He doesn't get frustrated if you keep calling. He doesn't get mad with you if you keep coming to the altar. He doesn't get mad if you keep shouting out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Call out. He loves to hear your voice. He loves to hear your, his name whispered across your lips. Call out to him. Don't be afraid to call out. In verse 8, the creed continues. It says, don't rejoice over me, my enemies. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Ah, I need to settle in right there. I think we need to declare to this morning to the enemies of our lives, to the enemies of our families, to the enemies of our church, to the enemies of our faith. We need to talk to those stumbling blocks that cause us to fall. Don't you laugh. Don't you mock. Stop thinking that you've got me. Stop thinking that I'm dead and gone because I will arise. I may have fallen down from your tricks. I may have fallen. My knees may have buckled at the weight of the burden and, uh, and, and of all the influences of your demons, but I'm getting back up. I may have fallen down, but I make a decree and a declaration this morning. I will arise. I may have taken a wild ride, but I will stand on my feet again. I'm going to hold my shoulders back. I'm going to walk like the child of God that I'm called to be. Don't rejoice over me yet, my enemies. Stop pointing your fingers at me, devil. I'm not dead in God. God is still able. I may have face planted, but I'm getting back up. If you're laughing and you're celebrating my defeat, it's too early to celebrate my defeat. It's too early to mock me. God is about to show up on my behalf. Don't you rejoice over me, my enemies. When I fall, I will arise. Oh, when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. You've cast me, devil, into darkness, but I'm going to call on the name of the Lord, and his light will displace your darkness. I've been in a thick cloud of heavy darkness weighing me down. The darkness has given me temporary blindness. But Jesus is about to walk into my crisis. And I will no longer be in the darkness because the, the, the light is going to expose all of that. And the darkness cannot cover the light. He cannot even dim the light of Jesus the Christ. Oh, I know I've been hurting myself in my darkness. I've been stumbling over things, breaking things, hurting people, and hurting myself because I've been trying to probe around in the darkness. But the darkness will no longer cause me to live in the fear. Oh, my crisis may have brought darkness, but my creed is the Lord is about to be a light in the middle of my darkness, and the light will erase all of my fear. The light will erase all of my confusion and all of my doubt. Don't rejoice over me, my enemies. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be light unto me. Look at verse 9. Here's the proper attitude for the one who repeats and participates in a personal revival. This is also the third section of the, the crisis creed. It says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord. I have sinned against him. Repentance. Until he pleads my case and execute justice for me. Allow the crisis of your life to lead you to a place of recognizing your sin. Allow the problems of your life to allow you to see your position uh, in, in, with Christ and be willing to bear the burden of the sin with this long thought in your mind. Be willing to bear the, the, the pressures of what you've gone through with this thought in mind. Jesus is the one who forgives me. He's the one that corrects every wrong that I has. He's the one that judges me. He's the one that justifies me. He's the one that washes all of my sins away. My sin may have set a fire in my crisis, but it is the love of Jesus Christ that will extinguish the fire, and it is the love of Christ that will cause 
me to be whole again. Oh yeah, I bear the indignation of what I have gone through. I will bear the weight and the punishment of my sin. But I know when I call on the name of the Lord Jesus, everybody will be saved. The Bible says whosoever calls on the Lord will be saved. I know that I'm not good enough now. But when my voice of faith cries out, Lord, save me. All of a sudden, the weight of that sin is lifted off of me. The guilt and the condemnation is no longer a part of me because Jesus is the one that forgives me of all of my sins. He's the one that justifies me. He's the one that washes them all away. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9 of that chapter says, Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Jesus will bring forth light. He will bring forth righteousness. And I am justified, not by my works, but I'm justified by my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm a man made innocent. I'm declared not guilty. I've escaped from the guilt and the condemnation of sin. I am made righteous not because of the actions I've taken. I'm made right, uh, uh, right because of the actions of Jesus Christ. It is His death on the cross. It is His resurrection from the grave that has created righteousness for me. Therefore I will stop putting so much pressure on myself. I will stop taking all the blame. I will cast it at the feet of Jesus Christ. I decide in this creed I will trust God to make me righteous. I'm not going to ever be good enough to be righteous. I'm going to never work myself enough to be righteous. All I got to do is call on the name of the Lord. I will stop trying to work myself into a right relationship with him and I will trust God and he will perform his wonderful work and out of that I will work from my place of righteousness. I will love out of my place of righteousness. In my season of crisis, it has not dismissed God's power. And my season of crisis has not diminished God's authority. He's still God. And he can still do what God loves to do. He can erase my sins. Oh, my enemies, they may see me weak. And they may see me vulnerable now. They may see me in a place of fatigue. And they may see me in a place of failure now. But shame is about to come on those. I said, shame's about to come to those who thought God had forgotten me. Shame is going to come on every enemy. Shame is going to come on every naysayer who told me God didn't love me and God didn't want me. That's what verse 10 says. Then that is my enemy shall see it and shame shall cover his face. The enemies of my life are about to be embarrassed because they have told me there was no hope for me. They told me I'd never be victorious. They told me I'd never be able to preach. They told me I'd never be able to have a successful marriage. They told me my kids would never serve God. They about to be embarrassed because God's about to show up in my life. Somebody ought to join in and give God praise right there. Shame's coming on the naysayers. Shame is coming on my enemies. Because God's raising me from the ashes of despair. I'm coming out of the cave of darkness. And I'm getting out of the mud puddle where the enemies tried to trample me down. You're about to see God in my life. Who said God is dead? You better step back. You're about to see the spirit of resurrection. Oh, yeah, I'm in a crisis. Yes, I'm in the middle of a problem. Yes, I'm in the middle of a situation. Oh, yeah, our country's in a crisis. Our world is in a crisis. The church uh, atmosphere is in a, in a crisis. But we ain't dead and gone. And there's still a God on his throne. And I'm declaring the crisis creed over Rising Fund this morning. I'm declaring the crisis creed over my family. I'm going to declare the crisis creed over America. Therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Don't rejoice over me my enemy. When I fall I will arise. When I sit in darkness the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and execute justice for me. He will bring me forth to light and I will see his righteousness. What's the results of these creeds? The result of the creed. Look at verse 10. It says, Then she who is my enemy will see. 
Shame will cover her who said to me, where's the Lord your God? My eyes will see her, the enemy. Now she will be trampled like mud in the streets. Listen, my enemy, the result of you calling out the creed of crisis is that the enemy will see and be ashamed. I don't know about you, but don't you like it when the enemy has to eat his own words? Don't you like it when the enemy told you how defeated you were and you're on the other side of that battle and you're victorious? Don't you like it when the enemy tells you there's no way God's going to provide for your need and then you come through the need with more than you had and the need is met? Don't you love it when your enemy has to zip his mouth, tuck his tail and run away because the husband that was never going to be saved is sitting there shouting victory louder than you are because the enemy, God is going to allow your enemy to see your victory. I will experience the villa, I will experience the thrill of victory, but the enemy will experience the agony of defeat. How oh, my enemy will return to its rightful place under my feet. Matthew chapter 22, 24 says, The Lord said to me, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Oh, let's look at verse 11. Let me add a little bit more. In that day, your walls are to be built. In that day shall the decree be far removed. My city has been in destroyed. But when I declare the creed, the walls will be rebuilt. Walls of protection will once again skyrocket around my city. I will once be surrounded with protection. I will once be in the center of refuge and in the center of hope and the center of peace. The day of victory and the day of restoration are coming. Oh, my desolation will not last forever. Yeah, my walls have been destroyed. But when I declare this in the name of the Lord, I will live in a safe place again. I know that my life's been a wreck. And I confess that I've sinned and I've fallen short of the glory of God. I admit that I've made mistakes. But I also know there's more hope in verse 18 and 19. Look at verse 18 and 19. Who is God like unto thee that pardons iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. All the result of the creed, God will pardon iniquity. He will pass over transgressions. You're a heritage. You, the remnant, are a heritage. He does not retain his anger forever. He delights in mercy. He will have compassion. I know you love to sin, but God loves to flow in mercy. He loves to operate in grace. Now listen, that's not a reason to sin, God forbid. But if I fall in a crisis, I have comfort and hope that he will cast my sins away into the depths of the sin again. Thank God he has compassion and he will take my, my sins and cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. He will, for, verse 19, he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us he will subdue our iniquities and cast them, all of our sins, into the depths of the sea. Can I tell you, God does not use your sins against you. I know some wives, mine and probably yours don't, but I've heard in the world, some wives will use something that happened 20 years ago when a fight happens. And, and, and even though that man for, uh, begged for forgiveness, pleaded for forgiveness, and made everything right, but when things go crazy... Those sins of yesterday are brought back up and you got to relive them as if you never have repented of them. That's not how God works. No matter how horrible you've been in your past, God forgives. He loves you and he wants to be compassionate. Run to him, Sister Nikki. Run to him and trust him. Run to him and trust him. We're living in a season of crisis personally, in our family. And maybe it is the seed of crisis brought on by my own immorality, brought on by my own sin. Oh, I know we're in a time of crisis, but I declare today, will you stand with me? I'm going to open this altar again, but before we're going to say this creed together, and I want you to say it out loud. Are you in a time of crisis? Is your family in a time of crisis? Micah prophetically laid out the plan for us to come through. 
Micah the prophet laid out the plan that God's going to have compassion on us. Oh, I know you're in crisis. I know the walls have been destroyed, but they're going to be built again. You're going to be in safety again. You don't have to die and go to hell today. No matter how bad your crisis is, he loves to flow in mercy. He loves to flow in grace. Before we come to the altar, will you raise your voice? And I want you to declare this. Everybody ready? Say it out loud. I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Don't rejoice over me, my enemies. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and justice for me. In Jesus' name, say amen. amen. Now, you've made that declaration. Don't you think it's time for you to enjoy those benefits that I skipped over in a hurry to try to make sure I got out on time? You can enjoy the benefits of what you just declared over your crisis. Take those scriptures. Are you in a crisis in your family? Read those verses out loud in the morning and at night. Then add verse 10 and 11 to it so you can see the benefits of those crises. That creed coming to erase where you are. This morning I want us to pray. I know we've had people in the altar since the opening chord, but if you're in a crisis this morning, won't you come? You're in a place and you just need help. You're in a place and you need to declare the creed. You need to stand in faith going, I'm in a mess. I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. Listen, if you don't know the Lord, I'm almost done. If everybody can just kind of hold steady, don't, don't leave. Somebody text my wife and tell her I'm going to be done in two minutes so she can have the kids lined up and ready. Listen, if you're a sinner this morning, you don't have to go to hell. But don't think you can make it on your own good merit. Some of the hardest people to get saved are good people. Oh, he'll give you the shirt off his back. He'll give you the last dollar in his wallet. He's a good man, but is he saved? You can be a good man and still go to hell. As a matter of fact, I dare say that hell's going to be full of a lot of good people. Because Jesus is the only way to get there. And you're not made justified because of what you are because of what he's done and he paid a price, a, 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 a price on the cross he was crucified so that today you could call on the name of the Lord and be saved so I'm going to tarry right here for a moment if you don't know the Lord is your savior why don't you come kneel and call on him is your crisis weighing on you or is your, is your crisis because of your sin 